Hello and welcome to another session of application development today. My name is Don Jackson. I'm your host. I'm also a chief technologist here at OpenText. And since this is our 15th episode, I thought it'd be good to remind everybody what the series is about. So the series, right? If you think about DevOps, people processing technology, the, the, the three legs of that stool, we're not talking about the technology. We're not talking about uh, the actual tools. Um, if you want to talk about tools, about open text tools, happy to have that conversation. Plus, we have lots of other videos available uh, on our YouTube channel that you can go in and see that. It's really talking about the process and, and the people, the impact of people. Today's topic is know your role. And just like in a, in a, in a MMORPG, massive multiplayer online role-playing game that I like to play with my kids, or a role-playing game like D&D, uh, &D, Dungeons & Dragons, you want to make sure you know your role and you're behaving appropriately for that role at the right time. So if you're a healer, you don't want to run into the battle first because you're going to get squished. So with that, I want to introduce my party for this particular one. I'm super excited to have our first repeat guest today, uh, featured guests in, in Chris Trimper and Dory uh, uh, Gon Gonzalez Acevedo, plus a, a new one uh, to this particular series, but I'm sure you all know him, Mr. Joe Colantonio. So I'm going to let you guys introduce yourselves. Uh, we're going to go uh, left to right, top to bottom, as it is as you are appearing on my screen. So uh, Chris Trimper, want to introduce yourself real quick. Thanks, Don. Uh, my name is Chris Trimper. I am a test engineer in the role of a solution expert, I guess, um, at Independent Health. Uh, I've been in the software space for 20 plus years, and I've actually had the opportunity to have a lot of roles. Believe it or not, I started off as a developer and found my way into testing along the way, um, enhancing my skills necessary for all the different roles that I've fulfilled. Um, I currently um, kind of oversee the technology and the solutions around our software testing space, specifically focusing on the areas in functional test automation and performance testing, but certainly always looking to help our team enhance the skills that they bring to the job, to their role. Um, I'm looking forward to chatting up with, with all of you today about talking about those roles. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. And uh, Dory, you want to introduce Thanks, yourself? Don. Yeah, thanks. It's a great to be back, too. Um, so I always enjoy our conversation, so I'm looking forward to today. I'm um, Dory Gonzalez Acevedo. I'm CEO and co-founder of Percelorex. For the last 25 plus years, um, I've been in the life science specific vertical. I started out as a uh, chemical process engineer um, and developed active pharmaceutical ingredients in the beginning of my career. And that launched um, at the time in which we all know, which you heard in our episode before, was the Part 11 um, requirements and what that means in, in a regulated space. So since that time, I've um, gone through a series of uh, consulting and being in site, um, on site within uh, organizations, but primarily in the computer software validation space. Um, now, computer software assurance um, for those those keywords out there that we need to get in. Um, but really, um, we adopt software quality best practices uh, from beginning to end, and it really doesn't really matter the vertical. We really want to make sure that people are doing the right thing in the right places in the right time. So today's topic around know your roles is really important. Um, we help organizations figure out what those mean, what should you be doing, and where is your space um, within your organization. So looking forward to today. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Dory. And, the, of, and last but certainly not least, Mr. Joe. Hey, Don. Great to be here. Thank you for inviting me with this awesome panel. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, those that don't know, I'm Joe Colantonio. I have over 25 years of experience in software automation testing. Basically, my role since the beginning has been with tools. So I started off mainly as a performance engineer and then started getting into functional automation and then became an automation architect. So really more of a toolsmith type person. But I did start early, early in my career as just a straight up tester. I'm also the founder of Test Guild, which is a independent resource for uh, real world technical advice around uh, different topics around automation, performance, security testing, DevOps, and security testing. And I also just published a book called Automation Awesomeness, it's like a one page a day resource for folks to help get up to speed with automation best practices every day. So great to be here. 
Awesome. Thanks for the introductions. And just to, just to remind you guys as a panel, right, we have something here on, on, the, on the podcast. It's DYA, define your acronym. So just your fair warning, if you use an acronym, make sure you define it. Otherwise, production guys are going to pop up the little DYA acronym and, <laughs> and, uh, and we might make it. Uh, but that's fun, fun too. So that, that's right? okay. yeah, it is fun. Very <laughs> fun. So uh, thanks, thanks to all of you guys for coming in. Um, you know, this is uh, this is the largest session that we've done on this series. Uh, I try to keep it, you know, uh, cozy so that we can have uh, robust and, and heartfelt conversations. So um, this is to open to all of you guys. Is what do you guys feel are really the key roles in a development team? You know, we we talk about. If you've gone to Scrum training, uh, if you've done your your uh, certified Scrum master, you'll hear you know everybody's the same, right? Uh, on a team, me personally, I find that hard to believe because we all bring different things, right? There's that diversity of thought. So what what do you guys feel are really the key roles in the, in the development team? Chris, you want to start? So sure, Chris, volunteer. You got volunteer. Uh, volunteer. So, so, so Dory rolled a twenty. And rolled a zero. Um, got gotcha you there. Um, I mean, so so if you break it down to just the key components, because you know there's there's levels. You know, you might be a level one mage, you might be a level whatever you max out at, right? So you know, there's certainly you, you're not going to have software without development. So there's there's the developer role, and that branches out into just so many different key areas. Um, you know, of course, you need to have checks and balances. So we have testers like myself, and and most of us here have fulfilled the role of a tester or are fulfilling a role as a tester. Um, but then certainly there's those that bring everything to the table. Um, you know, here we would consider them business analysts, but those that gather the requirements, whether it's from an external customer, an internal customer, um, and, and having that mindset to not only know what questions to ask, but in addition to be able to document them in a way that kind of closes the gaps, um, kind of leaves assumptions off to the side, but certainly make sure that the team is prepared and ready to roll. Um, of course, you know, there's, there's management and whatnot, but those are, are some of the key foundational roles that in my mind, and a lot of the other roles that have developed through time and really developed probably from saying, wow, that's a lot for a person to take on. Let's now branch that off, let's do more in addition to finding efficiencies as well. None of us would be involved in test automation if we were perfectly fine just sitting there, taking as much time as we possibly needed and just, just testing, testing, testing. That would have required us being happy doing these repetitive things, happy to uh, take ownership for any possible mistakes we would make because it's really easy to make mistakes when you do things over and over and over. But lastly, um, you know, we don't have unlimited time. So efficiencies and overwhelmingness is, is probably what has branched off all of the other roles um, that, that we'll be discussing today as well. Yeah. So one of the things, um, what you're saying, Chris, is I find valuable is the, that business analyst role. So kind of to answer your questions on, I see some key roles that are really super important, right? Product or process owner, like whatever you want to call that is really strong and understanding what the big picture really is and have holding everyone true to that. But that business analyst role um, is super specific in a SME sort of way, right? Really understand. So while the business process owner or the product owner may hold a higher objective, that business analyst gets into the weeds and knows exactly the ins and outs of everything um, and can document. SME, subject matter expert, right? <laughs> um, we want those Yay! in. <laughs> we want those in in the right places, right? And and that information, and it depends on what the user story you're talking about, right? It may that that SME might be a security SME, it might be um, um, an application SME, it might be a, a test automation SME. It depends on what it is, but that key SME role needs to be in there um, as well. The other thing um, I think is really important is, is the SQA role, the software quality assurance role, right? Um, while testers can do a really great job um, testing what they know, a software quality assurance role brings in a different aspect and making sure that all the parts are, are connected and together. Um, those are come, uh, some of the things when you say, when you originally started your question around, um, sometimes agile, everyone should be the same while everyone in theory should be the same, right? Or yeah. at least have some awareness of each and everyone's roles and why they're important. I think that's kind of the message that we want, right? We want everyone to be very aware of all the roles, 
but we want that diversity at the table in order to make the best product or user story or whatever we're making in that moment. So I think that's the big, big split and delineation there. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with both, both y'all. Um, I guess when I was working full time, uh, what they did is they wanted developers to do everything. So we had like multiple sprint teams and yeah. developers had a huge definition of done. They were supposed to do all things. And it was difficult because uh, it got rid of a lot of really seasoned uh, testers. And uh, I think it really hurt quality. So I agree. We really need to be pushing that there are really roles in this. Obviously, developers should be empowered to help with testing and testers should be empowered to contribute whenever they can to development if, if needs be. But to get rid of complete roles like these that have been around forever that have been proven to help, I think is detrimental to any any team. And I've seen it firsthand how it, how it hurts. Uh, one role I think really does help though is having more of like an architect role, like an automation mm -hmm. architect. So when I worked with like seven sprint teams, having uh, being an architect that sits outside the sprint teams and say, okay, here are the tools, here are the mm -hmm. techniques, training the teams, training the tests that are embedded onto those different sprint teams is really helpful. Also, I know, uh, you know, in the pre-show, we talked how the BA role seems to be going away. We had a UX role, a user experience role. I don't mm -hmm. know if it's the same as BA, and I found that really helpful as well. They, they actually were going to the user with the interface and the mock-ups to make sure before we developed it, hey, would you be able to interact with this? Does it make sense? And I found that a, a helpful role as well. I think I think uh, part of that too is is understanding what role you're playing at that given point. Yeah. Not that not that when you come onto a team, I get this role and that's all I'm doing. I think it's right. you know uh, especially when you think about like team developing, right? Somebody is it has their hands on the keyboard. The other person is over their shoulder watching what's going on. They're performing a quality role at that time, right? So understanding what you are and changing your mindset of what that is. Yep. So, but that requires uh, switching it up. Right, Don, it's also mm -hmm. really understanding per sprint what you're doing, what your role is, and that's why the cadence of the sprints are really important with a strong scrum master to be able to keep everyone on task, right? Um, and if you don't, then we've probably have all seen <laughs> sprints go sideways, <laughs> which is not yeah, helpful. This is my this is this is my fourth week of my two-week sprint. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you understand how sprints work. No, that's okay, right? Yeah. I don't think you understand how time works, but that's okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we talked about that. So one of the things that though that I, I I think is is worth mentioning when we talk about roles specifically is that in a regulated space, whether you're talking about life sciences or if you're talking about you know where you're heavily go governed by Sarbanes Oxley or SOX uh, regulations, is is the concept of delineation of duties. So I'm going to actually ask this one to you specifically. Dory is can you define what we mean by delineation of duties and when does it apply? When do you have to make sure that you have this delineation of duties? Yeah, so delineation of duties is really the separation and the responsibility of the given thing that you are reviewing and approving for. So if you are the quality assurance person on a given user story or test, you are looking for the overall quality as it relates to the entity that you're you're looking at. Um, if you're signing as a business process owner, you're ensuring that that user story fits the user requirement for the business process from a business process perspective. So it's really perspective-based roles and responsibilities, and you're sticking in your lane in that regard. Where those should occur is based on whatever regulation or business process that you are adopting. So in life sciences, there are certain control points and quality points that we want quality people or a regulatory affairs person in that process, right? Um, and therefore, they should be on that panel of delineation of duties. But then there are other things that are like security or um, some technical aspect that the quality is not necessary because who's the overarching responsible party in those are, are the technical owners. Right. And so those are the, the the highest level of approvals that we want. So it really depends on what it is that you're developing and why. And then having a clear path of who is part of that control process. And there's several of them. And depending on what regulations you're following, may be very super granular. Right. So if you're making a software as a medical device, each of those user stories are going to most likely be really super important. But if you're making um you know, a general application to manage some data for 
a learning management system? Not so much, right? So it kind of really depends on what it is and then where the control points are within that process. No, that's a great point. I used to work for a medical company. And so we had a verification and validation role that would make sure that we were living up to all the FDA type of uh, rules and regulations, make sure the software we were producing would meet it, make sure the tools that the developers were using were been verified by the company. And so I think a lot of people get confused by, um, you know, they go, oh, Google does it this way. Well, you know, you have to kind of switch it up when you're in a healthcare type of environment. You can't do everything that Google does and you, you shouldn't have to or want to. Uh, I think different contexts, different companies, different roles, they, they, they vary, and especially as you talked about um, when we deal with like FDA or, or regulations, you do need different type of roles that really do overlook that type of aspects as well. Yeah. And as somebody in the healthcare industry, Mr. Krimper, I would assume that you would concur? No, absolutely. And, and I was even going to bring up as well. So yes, those those are all incredibly valid but there's your role and there's your role at your organization. So as Joe was just alluding, you know, a software developer at Google is different than a software developer in a regulated space. And a lot of people, hopefully that get a chance to listen to this and, and other discussions will kind of glean that, you know, your role may not be the same everywhere. And if you are preparing to go into one of those spaces, these are the kind of things you either have to be aware are gonna happen or the kind of things that you want to be sure that you can work with um, because it's it's a different environment. You know, there's reasons why um, the development cycles and um, releases at a more open company like a Google is different than a more regulated space and the types of decisions you can make there as well. You know, we have incredibly um, robust considerations for when we choose software, when we choose vendors, when we choose new processes. You know, there's there's a lot of decisions that go along the way, and those are things to be aware of, both if you're in the role to go, better be following those things. Right. But if you're going to step into one of those roles at the organization, to be aware that that's, that's part of it. It's not just jump and do development the way you did it before or testing the way you did it before. And to add to that, Chris, I think it's important for folks to understand the level of risk associated to not only the task that they're doing, but the organization that they're in and what the tolerance of the, the risk is within that organization, because that changes from organization to organization. And we all know you can't test everything, right? It's just not possible, right? I know, uh, did I say a bad word? Like, I mean, people think <laughs> that they come to us and that everything must be tested and it must work like all this sort of stuff. and really understanding so that's kind of some of these fallacies that we have to break down and i think that's going to get even more when we talk into ai and machine learning for especially in the health and life science space we need to be able to understand risk and categorize risk in a better way that it's understood by all that's touching it the people that are developing it the people that are testing it the people that are consuming it right because it's not the same so if you have a little bug here or there is that really a a problem, but as long as you know it delivers what you need to deliver um, for health and vet, you know safety perspective, then it's okay. But yeah. if it's blue today and it's purple yesterday, <laughs> do I really care? <laughs> <laughs> and I think I think Dory, you you brought up uh, in in the first part of of answering this, you brought up something that I, I don't know if everyone uh, listening to this would have caught is you you were actually talking about at at this fine level of the role on that specific asset, right? You weren't saying the role for the release or the role for the sprint. You said the role for this user story. So the role that you're you're fulfilling in this particular user story, or you could even maybe break it down even further into a task level. In this particular task, as this task rolls to completion, Joe talked about definition of done, as it goes towards done, somebody has to fulfill this role. In some cases, do you need that uh, it to be someone different to fulfill that role? No, sometimes you can fulfill that role because uh, the level of risk, like, like we were just talking about, doesn't uh, necessitate to have those second set of eyes or third set of eyes in some cases to be able to look at something. So I think that's really important to, to under for, for everyone to understand is that it's the role that you have on that particular task or that particular user story or requirement. I'm not dictating. Yeah, because a release manager is a different role. 
And a release manager is looking at it much more holistically. And that's a different set of eyes at a different particular part of time, right? So mm -hmm. it's like all these levels. And I think, you know, one of the things I'm seeing in industry today is people are being asked to do many roles, right? We're being mm -hmm. asked to do more with less and it becomes very conflated. And, and then we're having a problem with, like where do we shortchange things like it, and it's not that people want to do that maliciously it's just that there is not enough time right and there's a pressure to to do things so understanding risk better um and having those conversations help mitigate that overarching risk if we you know look at those 10 user stories and we say one or two of them are super critical and the others are like okay so we can kind of you know get away sort of thing Yep. Yep. So Chris, I, I want to, I want to address a question to you. So, cause, cause you've it, it in my mind, famously, I don't know if anyone else has heard you say it, but you've, you said it in multiple will times now. It, in conversations <laughs> with me. Yeah. Is, is that testers don't always make good automation people and automation people don't always make good testers. So first off, I want to give you an, uh, an opportunity to explain what you mean by that. And then let's uh, open it up to the panel for discussion. Oh, sure. Thanks, Don. And, and yeah, I, I have said that on many occasions um, in different spaces. And it's just the notion that the kind of things that you bring to the table, the kind of experiences that you have um, as either a developer or a tester don't necessitate that, oh, I've tested a lot of projects where people have developed. I've written some automation code. Therefore, I can dive in and write RESTful services for this group or vice versa, I've written lots of um, frameworks and websites and I read user stories and I did some unit testing. So I'm gonna dive in and I'm gonna immediately fulfill the role as a, as a functional tester, whether it's test automation or whether it's manual testing. Um, you know, those two things, they, they bring different skills. Uh, it's, it's how you look at things. It's the different type of an analytical mind that you have. Um, I think all of us here would agree that both of those skills, um, any realm in testing, any realm in, in software development as a developer or, or similar, do require some form of analytical mind, absolutely. But it's the approaches taken and it's the considerations. Um, it may even be the way that a person perceives and works with risk, because I'm listening to Dory and realizing that is, is, is an underlying um, skill that we all need to have in this ever-changing world of demand. Um, so, so it's it's certainly something that's worrisome to me where a person says, well, I've gotten as far as I can in test automation, I'm gonna dive right into development because it's better for me. Or someone that's a software tester and says, I, I don't really like this, I'm gonna dive right into testing. Can people research the skills? Can they um, mature themselves with online schools, coaching, mentoring to transfer from one to the other? A absolutely. Um, we are not stuck in the one mold that we were, you know, we started off in. But to to have the thought that you can just dive right in and do it, and and I can test better than you because I'm a developer, or I've written automation for ten years and you've developed for one, I can develop better than you. That 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 doesn't really cut it. And I know that's going to sound a bit controversial, especially with, um, you know, all of the different roles, all of the different toolings out there. But it's it's really knowing what you need to bring to the party. What do you need to have? We'll go back to your D and D reference or or something like that. Um, the stats and attributes of of a healer versus a, uh, a uh, an assassin, I guess, um, are going to be very different for a very good reason. You need to know what you need to bring to the table. And with that, I'm I don't want to just totally talk about this. I can definitely see in, in Dory and Joe's eyes that. Mm -hmm there's some thoughts to join in and I, I'd like to extend on this, on this conversation. Well, yeah, I was going to say, Joe, look, you like, you, you look like you're chomping at the bit, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I mean, like I said, I spent most of my time as an automation engineer. I, I really think it's different than a tester. So, um, you know, when you, when you have an automation engineer that sometimes don't make as good as testers and testers don't make good automation engineers. So a lot of times you have, teams it, it all depends on the culture too sometimes you have a team of testers that are great at testing don't really have good development skills and, and you're like oh we need an automation framework let's have the testers build it when it probably would be better off if you had a developer build the framework for you 
um, and realize the testers would then use it and the testers will help drive the, the vision, but having a developer that has those skills to create their automation framework probably would have been a better fit. Uh, but I also think, uh, once again, uh, going back to risk is important. Uh, I think we should highlight that a little bit more because, you know, as we go cloud native and we go uh, relying on a lot of third party things, a lot of things we can't actually test now in the system until it's in production. Thinking about risk is really critical, especially developers thinking about if something goes wrong, what can I do to make sure it fails over to the next cloud server or something? Think, thinking about almost uh, resiliency, how can our applications be more resilient, may have more benefit than actually does it meet these five testing uh, inputs per se. So, you know, it, it all depends. And, you know, I've spoken with developers as well that get offended that when you say, hey, you shouldn't be testing because uh, you're a developer, you know. And they're like, well, I love testing. So you want to make sure you encourage them. So it all depends on the culture. Sometimes you're on a team with developers that actually are great testers as well. And they're able to switch context easily where I have a, does it work mindset? And now I have to go, how how does it not work? How can I break the mindset? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So I guess it all depends, but you know, it's kind of tricky with these roles because everyone's different, every team's different. Uh, but in general, I, I agree, sometimes testers don't necessarily make the best automation engineers, developers don't necessarily make some of the best testers, and testers obviously sometimes don't make the best developers. And you brought up something really, really key in there. And I think I think it, 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 it's time for us as humans to acknowledge humans, we are terrible at context switching. Yes. We are absolutely <laughs> hair Computers, great at context switching. Humans, terrible at context switching. So, so somebody, it, it's a rare find when you can find somebody who can very quickly flip hats and, and change from being a creator to a destroyer. Because, you know, in my mind, that's, that's yes. a, a big I, difference, right? A yeah. tester wants to break it. Yeah. Well, literally, Overall, sometimes I tell folks, like, what perspective are you going to be in today? right? Or in the meeting or what, because even in, we are asked to do all these meetings too, right? Like all the, everyone's on a meeting and what are we doing? Like, like, how, how are you going to show up? Like, and, and that needs to be a very conscious choice before you enter the meeting <laughs> or at take on a task. Like, what do you expect of me? Like this it's expectations too, right? Like, um, I think the, um, the other point, Joe, I wanted to come back to, though, is resilience. I really yeah. like that word a lot um, for Don to double down on your human thing, right? It, 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 this is a big part of this, right? We All of this, we, we can't keep pushing out patches and bugs and everything. Like, we need to think about what is resilience and what is good enough um, versus perfection. Yeah. Um, and... I think that that also comes into this in terms of the roles, because I think one of the things I see is folks then take on a, a role of an SQA, right, or a software quality assurance, and expect everything to be perfect. And I think that that's an unrealistic expectation, right? What is good enough? Back to the definition of done, right? Mm -hmm. And and keep moving forward to not slow progress because failing faster and for, that's part of the mantra, right? We need to be yeah. embracing that. And it goes back well, to this, once again, you get an overzealous verification validation engineer going, nope, 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 nope. And it's like, well, exactly. how risky is this though? I mean, exactly. We, we need to release it and you know the business right. needs to make money and we need it to work for the customers, but you're trying to hold it up for you know, exactly that, that gives testers a bad name then and then everyone's like well, oh. it's infighting, it's you know, it, it creates bad team dynamics. There's yeah. a whole sorted things that end up going bad when we don't when we're not on the same page with what is the appropriate level of risk for that level of definition of done. Yeah. Um yeah. and you know, we see it all the time. I am sure you guys do too, because it's it's not uncommon. It's a it's a mm -hmm. bad team dynamic and it the finger pointing gets very fast, very quickly when that goes sideways. Yeah, I think that the whole, sorry, go ahead. Oh, just, just to add to that too is, you know, we're talking about this role versus that role. And Dora, you brought up the role that you wear to a meeting. You know, I find there's meetings and then there's meetings. And <laughs> we shouldn't feel like we're so siloed that I'm in this role. This is my role. It's all I can do, you know, far too often. And and, and I realize a lot of our discussion is about development and testing, but there's all the other roles that we discussed uh, here as well, but it's not us versus them. Whatever role you're in, you're not 
you know, fighting against all the other roles. The innate need for communication and collaboration is still there. And, you know, those small meetings to coordinate with the person that wrote the story to understand it better, to have developers and testers working together towards a common goal um, and release and, and all the other roles we mentioned is incredibly important. And, and often when you do um, retrospectives on any of your agile or agile-like techniques, um, people are afraid to say it, but often communication is, is sadly a failure. And it's one of those things where we put so much emphasis on the process, we put so much emphasis on the tool because they're going to save us, but it comes down to the people and the willing to work together and collaborate. I didn't want to lose out on that while we were kind of stretching into that moment. Yeah, yeah and, and I think I think uh, the, the, the mention about the definition of done, I think something else that we all have to understand is MVP, minimally viable product. What is, the V is really important in that in the context of risk. So what's viable for, uh, for uh, a contact management system is totally different than what's viable for the, the firmware that goes into a pacemaker, right? What's viable, right? <laughs> failing, failing on the pacemaker, not okay. <laughs> right? right. It needs to work. It just needs to work. Right. So the level of rigor you have to do on that because the risk is so high on the contact management system. Right. If if look, if my contacts on my phone don't work for half a day, I may not even notice in today's <laughs> world. Right. <laughs> because I don't use my telephone, you know, my phone to be. A so phone, and, and I want to counter right? that, Don, just a, a, a moment, because for you, for us, that's true. But for that company that owns that app is extremely important for their brand right. and their reputation. And so what mm -hmm. I think folks also need to understand, we were talking about, you know, regulations and context, but in this day and age, brands are important, brand reputation. And so I also see a lot of skimping on, frankly, like what is important to the brand versus the right, like, mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll, we'll swap, you know, priorities depending on what is working, what's not working rather than being firm, true of, of what it is that we want to make to your minimum viable product definition, uh, being really clear about what is that end state, right? Um, what is the user experience? Because if that user experience is associated to our brand reputation and that's going to mm -hmm. get us to the end line, then that is really super critical. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's but, but a, everyone needs to understand what that is. And most, you know, the people that are doing the day to day work often are not in those conversations. Yeah. And I think I think everyone understanding that you are ambassadors of your brand. You are always an ambassador of your brand. If we look just on the on the screen. OK, I've got an open text logo shirt on because I work for open text. Um, and Joe's got, you know, his test guild stuff all over the place, right? I'm a little jealous, right? I want the cool uh, neon <laughs> thing in the cool. back. You know, but uh, we are all ambassadors of our brand, right? So if you think about that as, as whatever role you're performing on an individual task or user story, understanding the ambassador of your brand. And that goes to that concept that has become uh, kind of just a saying of everyone owns quality. It really should be true. And... I'm not sure what happened there, but Chris went dark for a moment. Um, that was exciting. Yeah. So um, I, 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 I got one more question that I really wanted to get in, uh, and because it, it's a great conversation and, and lively conversation, and I enjoy these conversations, but I also am cognizant of time. Is um, it, it was alluded to earlier? Is we're all being asked to do more with less, right? You, you're, you're, you're asked to accomplish more story points with less resources, spend less. How does, how does the, that, it seems to me at least that that concept of doing more with less is in direct contradiction to making sure that you're doing delineation of duties when, when necessary, that you're understanding your role and being able to context switch, which we are humans are terrible at. What are you guys' opinions on that? I'll ask Joe first. I mean, I keep going back to risk, but if you focus on risk, then that could help. I think also we need to do a better job of communicating to the business. You know, it's a business decision. You have to choose, you know, we're gonna release and we're gonna release here. Are you willing to accept this amount of risk when we go to production? Because 
by cutting back on this, you're going to lose this, this, and this. So it goes back to communication and culture and make sure you, when you have an open dialogue, say, okay, we understand we need to do more with less, but when you do more with less, you're going to get, uh, you have to accept these certain risks when we go into production, when, when you, when you do these types of decisions. And, and obviously the business is going to do what they do, but it's our job to uh, advocate what we think is right and let them decide at that point is basically the best we can do and try to make the most of it, the best culture that we can. And, uh, yeah, just like you said, just it's just you kind of have to get the whole culture involved as a test first type of an organization. And even you're doing more, even if you're doing more than less, if you have risk, you know, you want to make sure you're focusing on accessibility, security, performance, and keeping those in mind as well. Even though you're doing more and more, but you know, once again, if you have something risky, could this be a security issue? If not, then I don't have to worry about it. Can this be a performance issue? And uh, just have to deal with it, I guess. Uh, I don't know if there's any, a better answer, but the business is the <laughs> business, and you know you, they give you the paycheck only if you can just make sure you're you're verbalizing it and you're you're giving them the decision, you're, you're giving them the information they need to make decisions, and being as open and honest as you can be, and uh, it's the best you could do. And Joe, you're you're talking about something too that that Chris talked about earlier, right? Communication, right? Yep. Open lines of communication, right? Identifying the risk, communicating that risk making sure that it's understood what that risk is. However, if you never touched it, that's a different different level of risk. You haven't actually identified all the risks, right? But, but understanding and doing risk assessments of your backlog or your requirements, once again, not telling you how you should do your development, mm -hmm. but doing a risk assessment of, of whatever it is that you're working on is critical. And that leads back to the conversation earlier about that Dory emphasized very heavily on business analysts, right? Whoever, you don't necessarily have to have somebody that's called a business analyst, but somebody who understands the business well enough and can translate that into the backlog or the requirements and understands the risk, you know, probability of failure, cost of failure, those two category, those two uh, areas of categorization for or that risk assessment. Yeah, so, I just jump in and say what, one ahead. of the yeah. things in my career that I've seen has not been technical. It's it's usually not a technical issue. It, it's always funny. And you we always think, oh, we'll have a new database. We have a new tool uh, that'll solve everything. It always goes back to culture and communication. Absolutely it needs to be helped. It needs to be improved because that is the yeah. golden that is the golden ticket to get you to where you need to be. And a lot of people just overlook it. Oh, that's just. Yeah. That, that that could be easy, but that's the hardest and it is the most beneficial for sure. I completely agree with Joe and I, I want to double down on because um, Joe, you, you did a really great job at describing what happens and what's needed at the, the operational level. I want to use this opportunity to call out the CIO and C-suite level folks um, because just because you have a goal and think you know where you want to go you need to listen to your people and understand that what you think can happen may not be possible. And I think that there's a real big disconnect within a hierarchy of organizations that are not listening to their people. We're an overworked, overburdened workforce that is asking for help. And there are things, there are choices to be made, just like Joe said, not everything can be there. And so the leaders need to listen. Um, more rather than talk. Yeah, and and frankly, that self, shameless self-plug here, right? The shift everywhere mentality, right? Shift left, shift right are very important. I'm not discounting that, but a lot of people don't talk about shifting up, right? Yeah. Not only not only do, does the, the senior executive need to be able to communicate that down and understand what the art of possible, right? The art of what is possible. We, that are worker bees as well, need to make sure that we're shifting that information up at the pro appropriate level as well, that we are elevating the information to where it's consumable for somebody, you know, you think about, you think about a CEO, right? If you're going to a CEO to talk about uh, the release of a product, you know, the last meeting that they were in might've been talking about, you know, $10 million of real estate and the meeting before that, and they're in back-to-back -back meetings all day, the meeting before that, they may have been talking with shareholders, right? about the prospectus. So being able to communicate, we go back to communication as well, but communicate that information up and down and tying that together is, is absolutely critical. So guys, 
Thank you so much for, for the lively conversation. Um, I always give, uh, as everyone knows, the chance for parting thoughts, words of wisdom. And since we did introductions from left, right, top, bottom on my screen, we're going to go the opposite way for parting thoughts or, or words of wisdom. So, Joe, what are Joe's words of wisdom around Know Your Role or something else? All right, so shameless plug. I'll rely on experts to give you wisdom. After every uh, podcast I do, I always ask people to tell me one piece of actionable advice you can give to someone to help them with their automation testing efforts. And I compile them into a book called Automation Awesomeness, 260 Actionable Affirmations to Improve Your QA and Automation Testing Skills. And includes things like roles, uh, risk, uh, automation, everything we've talked about. And it's a one page a day book. I recommend they check it out. Just go to testskill.com forward slash book or automation book, and it'll take you there. Thank you so much, Joe. I, I do self-plugs, too. I get it, right? Uh, <laughs> so Dory, uh, Dory's words of wisdom. So I actually was um, really encouraged by, like, always know, search to think about things you don't know. And so being on a podcast with other experts in other areas is something that I enjoy. And I think other people need to like reach out across the aisles more and more and learn and bring into that, that SME knowledge, right. And areas that you don't know, because I don't know everything and I enjoy not knowing everything. And I want to know smart people that know things about other things. So it was a pleasure to, to meet you, Chris and Joe. And um, yeah, I appreciate it. So Chris's words of wisdom. And I'll, and I'll try to keep it Other short. Than always unlike, roll twenty, right? Uh, unlike the normal Chris, I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> um, I, I will. I will affirm that that Joe's book is pretty cool in the sense that it does give you a hmm moment every time you read something. Just like every time you see a podcast, just like this one and others, you should have that hmm moment, something to take away, something to think about. And with that, my, my parting word with it within your role, um, something that I continually try to bring to our organization in my role is efficiencies. Efficiencies don't just mean, well, you know, uh, I got to start using a Keurig to make my coffee as opposed to, you know, the, the slower cup of coffee maker or something like that. But it's it's ways to make yourself more efficient, to better yourself, and that will help elevate it. And, and in addition, in these worlds that we're going to where we're being asked to do more, you know, we can push back, we can evaluate risks, and we can do all those things. But there's going to be times where they're like, great, but do it anyways. Well, if I haven't bettered myself through community, through podcasts like this one and listen to others and grow from those experiences, I'm stuck. You now, the number one most important interview question in my mind when I interview people for roles is what do you do to better yourself? How do you continue your, your learning? And if I get the deer in headlights look, I'm worried because mm -hmm. continuing to evolve yourself and in the way I simplify it, continuing to make yourself more efficient and better is something absolutely essential to, to your role. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I want to thank uh, all, all three of you for, for taking the time today. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the session as you're listening to this. If you have ideas for additional topics that you'd like to, to see on the podcast, feel free to reach out to me. My name is Don Jackson. That's djackson3 at opentext.com. Uh, this particular one was actually from uh, a user feedback as well. And uh, once again, I want to thank uh, Chris, Dory, Joe for taking the time out today. I hope you enjoyed the session and go out and get, get Joe's book because Joe's words of wisdom, he's got them documented for you in the whole awesome. thing. So, all right. Thanks, everyone. And have a great rest of your day. You Bye, guys. Bye. Take great, care. Great being with you. If you like the video, please click the like button. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you get notified when we release new videos.